um, first of all, I would just like to show you a couple of things we've done with the spec. And so we've been we've been revising spec based on feedback that's been coming in um, from all kinds of places, um, and we've not made any major changes. Um, but uh, I'll I'll go through the changes that we have made based on that um, different places, uh, different people providing that feedback. Um, it's it's unfortunate we haven't managed to get much interaction with the GitHub issues, although we have had some issues where people have been um, commenting. But I think it's easier for people over the phone and maybe in individual calls than on, on one big call, it turns out. So uh, we'll continue this process uh, and bring as much into the open as we can from, from those um, individual conversations. Um, so uh, yeah, we've got just published before this call a new version, um, so a couple of minor changes. So one of the things we've done is clarified the scope. It was a bit simplistic before, but it turns out that over the time and in, in the various conversations, we've actually ended up including a bit more in the scope than we, um, I think, had. Um, well, I, I think we anticipated to include a lot of this actually at the beginning, but I think the detail in the spec around things like cancellations um, has, has on tax has actually taken over a lot more than we originally anticipated. So just clarifying that here. Um, and uh, also just uh, a couple of things I'll, I'll go through and, and, um, with, that we missed in the last um, call. Booking approval, um, we've added um, on the basis, not as a, as a mandatory thing, but on the basis that it's prerequisite for some booking systems to have an approval flow um, because some booking systems work on that basis. So you can't just book it. You have to wait for someone on the other side to say yes, and then it's confirmed. So a minor tweak to allow that to be possible. Um, and other than that, I think everything is the same as it, it was in the previous version. Um, and then we've also clarified what is also out of scope. So that's including things like um, the subscriptions. Uh, so you can't, you can't um, create members using the spec, which uh, again is obvious from the spec content itself, but just making that kind of clear in this section. Um, some of the decisions we made about business to business tax calculation being out of scope um, and that we've, um, we're not including GDPR kind of collecting marketing preferences, anything like that in there. Um, and so that hopefully helps to clarify again what is in and out of scope. Um, another thing we've done is we've, we've actually updated the, um, there's another spec we've added and we've updated this spec to connect to it or well, link to it. Um, and that spec is called the dataset API discovery spec, um, which I haven't, as you can see from the title, isn't completely updated yet. So uh, this is just a very, very early draft of, um, oh, it's not even there, uh, data sets. Uh, so, um, this is a, a, a very early draft of, of what that, uh, that discovery spec. And what that basically is, is um, what this is documenting in detail is what we already have to an extent in use in a lot of places. And actually, I know that Gladstone have, have just implemented this as, a, this as a standard part of their system. So it's this page, basically. This is the page that links to the feeds. Um, and so when this page... It, although it looks shiny, it's actually the, the code behind this page that we've included in this, this, this specification. So this is the information uh, that's encoded in the page. Uh, you can see some uh, JSON there. Um, and, uh, and that information is available for to be machine read. So you can find out where those um, endpoints actually are by just accessing this page. Uh, and Google and others do, do this kind of indexing. So they they use this same spec to, to get that detail. Um, uh, so that's what that is. So there's a whole new spec, um, which is good because we're trying to finalize the booking spec, which means we can not worry about some of the things that are in this spec and do that a bit later. Um, I mean, they're not of much consequence, if I'm honest, to, to most people. It's more technical details about the kind of standards we're basing this off of. Um, these data set sites, as you probably know, have been around for a long time now. Um, and most people, uh, in fact, I think all publishers have got a data set site on the status page. Uh, you, can, you can click on any one of these and link through to uh, the status sites that, uh, sorry, the um, data set sites that, that these publishers have, and they're all using the same template. So 
basically we're just slightly improving that to include some of the fields that aren't in there at the moment. Um, and uh, you'll see that in the in the latest version, which is the one that Gladstone have, have kind of done a little bit ahead of time, um, there's four different feeds in there instead of the original kind of one. Um, so there's a bit more information um, compared with, with this version. Um, we've also got rid of the mailing list and replaced it with a recommendation around using GitHub uh, for discussions. So the idea is every data set um, would have a GitHub page, which a lot of them already do. Um, and then you use this for the, the conversation rather than the mailing list, Main, mainly because the mailing list wasn't seeing much uptake. A lot of people are using the feeds, but no one was joining the mailing list. So um, rather than having that maintenance burden, we just thought let's move it towards, towards that. So, uh, so that's what's going on with that. Um, and uh, there's a lot of uh, other stuff to go in this spec. Uh, and so you'll see there's a lot of headings, but no content. That's some work to do. Um, but thought it'd be better to share this early and so you could all see what was going on. And that does mean that some of the elements of the actual open uh, booking spec, we can move across into uh, the, uh, the, the data set site spec, the data set discovery spec. And they are the information about the uh, discovery model. There's a lot of stuff in there that is going to move across and then the URL discovery section here too. So we're just going to remove some of that from this, which actually helps us focus on the important content. Um, so that's what this is, uh, it's out of scope. Um, and so that's, that's been added and that's that link there and everything else is as it was. Um, and, and then um, a couple of things that we've gone through and, and looked at are the um, versioning. So I've got a, com a question for you guys actually in a minute. Um, so I'm gonna ask about versioning. Um, and uh, so we'll see if, if anyone's got any views on that. Um, and then uh, other than that, I think probably the best thing to do is just to then whiz through the spec for those on the call who, who haven't seen as much of it um, to make sure that you've got an opportunity to provide thoughts uh, on the different aspects. So, um, I, and it's, and I know that because some of you guys are new to this, it's going to be difficult to answer this question, but I thought I'll just see if you've got a, any general idea from a technical perspective uh, on this question, which is, um, we've got to decide on version numbers for the uh, specifications and for how we use those version numbers when we publish according to those versions. And basically, there's two options um, that are, we've looked at. Um, what it means is when you, as a booking system, implement the version of the specification, there's two ways we can do it. Either we have one version for all of Open Active that says Open Active is version, you're using Open Active version one. Um, so here's the slide. Um, and if you're using Open Active version one, then you must be using this version of the booking spec, this version of model spec, this version of RPG, this version of discovery. Um, and so we've got one that one version that we use and you know if you're working with a booking system that's conforming to that version exactly what to expect from all the specifications underneath it conversely if you're implementing against a specification uh, against a, a version number you know that you've conformed to that version when you've met the version numbers of all the specs underneath it um, so that's one approach and then the other approach is to have um, kind of use the versions of the specs that already exist and have some dependencies between them, a bit like you would have dependency management in, in libraries. Uh, so booking spec version one uses modeling spec version two and RPD version one. Uh, publishing requires uh, any combination of the two, so you don't have to have any fixed uh, combination, which means there's more potential uh, variance in what you can do as a data publisher, you could implement version one of the modeling spec and version two of publishing or whatever you want to do. And discovery will be separate as well. So you don't have that uniformity of guaranteeing everything is the same, but you get more flexibility because you could implement different versions of different bits of it, if you like. Um, so this is more flexible, um, but obviously means it's slightly more complicated for data users because you'll have to deal with different versions. Um, and this is, this is uh, less flexible, but simplifies the, um, what people can expect from implementers. So, can I ask Nick, uh, on the first example you gave, mm. um, if uh, 
we were to go down that road, wouldn't it make sense to um, have everything on the same initial number? Um, so open active one means you're booking one point X, modeling one point X, etc. Um, so if you are actually kind of forcing them onto uh, a specific version of that, if you're within the open active version, then they share the same number. It's a very good idea. Uh, the challenge we've got is that modeling version two and modeling version one already exist. Uh, and people have in fact implemented modeling version one and modeling version two. Uh, so unless we started at two, uh, but, then, but then RPDE version one also exists. Uh, so I guess we've got a challenge because these two in combination are in, in heavy use. Yeah, okay. I, maybe we were early enough to influence that, but... Um, <laughs> Fair enough, yeah. I'm not sure. Move to three. Does it, yeah. Does it, um, uh, no one, is there any reason why uh, you can be on different, on the, in the second version, uh, the second option, uh, be, be on different um, versions of the booking and publishing? Any reason why you can't do that? Uh, any reason why you can't do that? Uh, yeah. There's no technical reason. You could implement one of one and one of the other. Um, and it's just a question of whether that would make it. Yeah, so that, that allows you to do things like upgrade your publishing before you've upgraded your booking. And uh, then a, a data user would need to know how to work with both, I guess. But, but kind of forward planning five years, um, it would be possible for someone to be on publishing 10.0 and booking 1.0. Right. That's exactly right. Um, well, then I, I would suggest, um, being probably the least technical person in the school, I would suggest that is a better approach. Just give people more flexibility rather than forcing them, because um, if someone wants to adopt uh, a later version of the booking spec, but keep on to uh, keep their um, modeling spec and discovery spec the same, then they'd be able to do that. Yeah, great. That makes sense. And so, and actually, as a data user, you're perfectly placed because your uh, the disadvantage, of course, would be on your side. So you would have to have more permutations to, to connect to, uh, because of course people can choose what combinations that they are are using. But you're happy with that. You'd rather that as a um, because of the benefits of flexibility for the publishers. Um, Javi, what do you think on that point? <laughs> don't don't turn that ball to me. <laughs> <laughs> you got in there yourself. <laughs> I mean, you put it like that, and that's not the way I would um, want it. Then, Nick. But but, um, but, but but no, I mean, but, but that wasn't. I wasn't trying to be divisive there at all, Jamie. I was just. It was a question of you know. It's great if you've said that as a data user. That's perfect because we can definitely go flexible because you know you're happy with it. Uh, that's that's. It would be if a booking system said flexible. You see, because they're on the other side, then that would be. A, I'd be saying, yeah. Jim, what do you think? <laughs> um, anyway, so I obviously you, you, you need to have different uh, um, versioning for different modules because each one will evolve differently. That's it. That, there is no reason. Um, um, to be honest, I prefer option one, uh, the the right hand side of the slide, because from <coughs> from if the provider, if the data provider says, um, we are using OpenActive 1.0, at least you know in one go exactly all the different versions that they are using for all the different modules. Uh, and that's something that you don't have to figure out yourself. Or, I mean, it, it creates like a common language for everyone, for both the providers and the, and the consumers. Um, but as I, said, I mean, Obviously, each company will have their, their constraints. They will, for some reason, they will have to upgrade to a major version or they won't be able to for, I don't know, maybe they don't have enough resources to, to upgrade to the latest version and they are stick on the old version. So even though I agree with the first option, uh, each company will have the, its own problems and they will probably give you a list of numbers and versions that they have and you do the better you can do with that as a consumer. I would go for option one. Okay. Um, does anyone else have that? What do you, what do you think, Daniel? <laughs> I think that makes more sense. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
I mean, I, you know, it could go either way. Uh, we, we, I don't mind. Which, uh, what, what do you think? Uh, anyone else wants to chip in on this? It's a Roger here, participant. I, I, I need to speak to our, our tech guys, but I, I, I'll be favouring the, the structure of the right hand side of the slide. Uh, okay. I think that's Javier. I agree with Javier's bit on that. But I, I, I don't think I'm necessarily the right person to, to, to influence this from our, from our point of view because. From, from what I've gathered and the ease of use and having some sort of uh, structure and uh, consistency, I'll go for the, the right hand side. But I don't think, yeah, that's, 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 from my point of view, I think that we'd go with that option. But. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Um, and so, as a booking system, you'd rather, because um, of the other the consequence for a booking system, of course, is that if you wanted to update to the next version, you would have to update all the bits, you couldn't choose yeah. to leave one behind. Um, but that's yeah. something you'd, you'd prefer to do, I think. Yeah, I mean, from my point of view, but, you know, like I said, you know, when I, when I bring in our, our tech guys later, <laughs> they might uh, they might have a, have a different opinion, but I can always come back to you on that. Yes, please do. Please do. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that'd, yeah. Be, that'd be really valuable. Um, uh, does anyone else? Uh, show out? Out of, out of curiosity, oh. have, you, yeah. have you done any investigations on how to do... Uh, uh, dependency management with different APIs because I, I never heard of it. Uh, I know that some people have tried, uh, especially for uh, companies running microservices and whatnot. But um, I was I was curious if you if there are something already in place to handle that. Uh, that's a good point. Um, we have no, I haven't looked specifically at the microservices. You're right, there would be, wouldn't there? But I, I mainly because that if we, I felt like if we were going into that world, it might be too complicated. The the suggestion here is is just that the at a high level, um, if you're using booking version one, it includes these two. Um, and if you're using publishing, it's kind of its own thing. And so you don't need to, I guess the way you would have to code it as a data user is you would have to code against all the versions of publishing you support. And then you would code against the versions of booking you support independently um, okay. and the versions of discovery you support. And then you would then um, just you would have different combinations basically that you would be able to it would be obviously it'd be slightly more difficult to test because you'd have lots of combinations but exactly. you, you you would have to then yeah just rather than depend, dependency management in the microservices sense of oh we're going to use these two together because and that one pass this information over there it's more kind of siloed yeah but still you have to test the whole thing so if the company could stick to Anyway, no, no. so I, I keep thinking that the, the, the first option, the option on the right hand side is, is slightly better. Okay. Uh, it, I think it's clear and less prone to making maybe some assumptions or trying to have to test so many options. Yeah, that makes, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, this is Schwab from Legend. So yeah, actually I will also prefer option one. It's simply because, uh, option one, by option one, I mean the, uh, the thing on the left hand side. It's just that it gives us flexibility that uh, we can just go ahead and implement something uh, standalone without having to just, uh, if you want to, let's say, implement version two of some of Open Active, then you'll have to do quite a lot of work to get to a 2.0. So whereas uh, with op left on the thing on the left hand side, we can independently or incrementally uh, move things as uh, our uh, time, frame, time frame allows us. So it gives sure. us more flexibility. Yeah, that makes sense. So you're not, you don't have to move to the next, uh, the next version up um, if you, if you don't want to. Um, so um, that's actually what I, yeah, I shouldn't have seeded that, should I, with uh, Jamie's comment on <laughs> both sides, uh, the advantages of, but um, yeah, okay. So I guess this is a thing. It's the complexity of the different versions needs to live somewhere. It's either on the data user or it's the publishing side. Um, and so, uh, it sounds like that's, um, as you say. Uh, 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 by the way, are these uh, versions, uh, uh, because I've not been in the previous meetings, are they backward compatible to each other? Like if you got a new version of RDPE, will it still be compatible with the, the previous version of booking? Yes, so they're Semver versions, so um, semantic versioning. So uh, version one will be compatible with all of version one backwards, uh, but version two is a breaking change. Okay, what about if there is a dependency between the two different specs, like uh, over here you said modeling and RDPE. So 
is there any dependency between these two themselves like well so there is, absolutely so that's where this complexity comes from actually so uh the booking spec requires uh rpd and modeling um and then publishing also uses rpd and modeling separately um so it's feasible that in this version you could implement you know someone could update to booking spec to uh well actually less likely probably more likely to update publishing to rpd2 and modeling version 3 and leave booking on modeling version 2 and rpd version 1 do you see what i mean okay yeah because they're separate because they're separate um endpoints so you could just have one set of endpoints that are higher than the other set of endpoints Okay, just to clarify, so we'll have to going forward because currently we've got a RDP feed, I think, which you have, you have seen as well. Yes. So over here, you've got two, two RDP feeds. So yep. have we, do we need to create two versions of it? Uh, right if now. We have to implement booking. So now you have, a, you at the moment, you have uh, implemented in Legend has, has this. But, uh, and, and currently Gladstone has this. Um, and in the conversation today is obviously about this booking overall um so you already have this in your feeds in the future if we had a new version of modeling you could update this to this and leave booking in the old one okay so the booking will need its own rdp yes separate uh, and it's an rpd feed of booking uh but orders so an orders feed uh, whereas the RPD feed here is of um, activities. Oh, okay. Uh, it makes sense then. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So, um, so you're so just to check. Still think this is this is a better thing, uh, given that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think first one gives us some flexibility, so we don't have to just uh, go through long period of development cycles. Uh, we can just implement something and then just move it. Uh, just publish it out. Okay. Cool, that sounds good. Um, well, I guess that's, um, that's a clear split. So I will <laughs> move on from there. Um, uh, but that's a, that's a really good discussion. I mean, it sounds like it, if this is a simple version, there might be a halfway house here where we, we, we do our, we, the spec does this, but we could always advertise um, at a kind of um, product level this so that there's a, a notion that if someone wanted to move to a next kind of consistent set of things that you could talk about it. Uh, so you could talk about it like this, a bit like, you know, um, the model of a, a car or something, you know, you don't, you don't talk about the type of, um, yeah, you don't talk about the engine spec. Um, but obviously when you build the car, you'd actually would need all of that stuff. So, um, cool. Okay. Thank you. Um, right, so moving on to the next point. Um, so this is about the minimum amount of work you would need to do to implement the booking spec. Um, for those of you who are new to the booking spec, um, and apologies to everybody else, I'll just, if I just spend three minutes, uh, five minutes, just quickly covering what the booking spec is again. Um, so you've got that background. Um, these are our favorite little uh, diagrams that we know and love now because we've seen them so many times. Um, so this is, uh, uh, this is the different actors that are involved in the system. So you've got a booking system uh, such as participant or legend on the call. You've got a broker such as my local pitch. Um, and uh, then you've got the seller, which would be a customer of the booking system. So that would be uh, GLL. And then you've got a, uh, a customer. Hey, Izzy. Um, and we've got a customer um, who is a customer of the broker. So that's the, the kind of flow. I'm sorry, the, that's the kind, of, the kind of different actors. And then we've got the payment provider that sits outside of these as another independent organization um, that, that might be interacting. And so the idea is that a broker uses a payment provider. So my local pitch might use Stripe um, and the seller has an account with that payment provider or however that's set up. And, and then that's, that's how that works. Uh, it might be possible that the, bro the broker is also providing the payment provider as one thing. 
um, equally could be there could be a lot number of mixes here um, but effectively the point is this spec covers the arrow between the broker and the booking system so that's the focus it doesn't cover any of this other stuff and so that means that um, things like commission uh, is out of scope because that's actually not something between these two that's between the um, the broker and the um, and the seller or and I'll, I'll come on to that so uh, the booking flow, we've broken into three steps. So there's select, register, and book and pay. Um, select is uh, the first step, which you don't have to do using um, an interface. This could be you're using Alexa or you're using something else uh, to say, I want to go to do that, do that activity. Registration, you might already have a login page. That, so you might, sorry, you might have the customer logged in. And so if the customer's logged in, you don't need to ask them again for their details. That's already there. And for book and pay, um, that again, your card details might be stored. Um, you might be using other types of payment methods like move credits or employment well, employee wellness vouchers. So all of this means that um, these steps are kind of just notional um, steps. They're just logical. They're not an actual user interface. Um, and what that leads us to is this kind of this journey here. This is the API uh, flow. So it starts with you select what you want. And at that point, the broker sends a request of order quote to the booking system. They send an order quote to the booking system and the booking system replies with the kind of shopping basket. So what's in the shopping basket? So um, you might say, I want this, I want this Zumba class at 7.30. You, you ping that to the booking system, booking system comes back, great, that'll be this much tax and this is a total. And then you can, you've got the information for your shopping basket to display that total. Um, you can make that same call again, but you can do it during registration as well. So if you've got some customer details, you can send the same call. I'll explain why that might be useful in a minute, but it's the same idea, exactly the same call. You say, here's uh, the detail about the customer, here's the basket, it comes back, that's the total, this is a tax. Um, and then finally, the book step. So assuming that both are successful, or even if you don't need to do one is optional, you could just do two. Um, assuming that you've got that successful order quote back that says you can make that booking, you authorize the total amount that's come back from that quote with your payment provider. So if that was a credit card payment, for example, you, would, you could authorize that at that point and say um, seven pounds plus including tax, I'm gonna authorize that from the card. You then make a booking call to the payment system. The booking call to the payment system uh, that then confirms that booking with the payment system. And if that's successful, you move to capture the payment from the payment provider. That's the final step. Um, so um, if we were to strip this back to kind of minimum uh, required, which, uh, what, what does that look like? So minimum required is just the quote, uh, order quote and order. You only need two endpoints. Okay, thanks. So that's just, just basically, you don't, so the order quote in a minimum form doesn't even, didn't need to do anything intelligent. It just needs to reply with the availability. Um, so it doesn't store anything. It's just a dumb kind of availability endpoint in the basic form. The order um, endpoint is where the magic happens, I guess. That's where you say, I want to buy this, this Simba class and it takes, subtracts one from the available spaces uh, and returns a conf confirmation. But that's a single call. So the um, order quote is um, uh, that essentially can be the um, data that's just showing what's available and how much it is. The kind of facility uses and that. Um, I can't remember the exact ten point, but um, right. slots and facility uses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. So um, and so really, the booking spec is um, the really key bit. Is just that that final one, uh, the the order. For a minimum, the implementation, absolutely, that's yeah. right. That's right. So the, the final order, which you, I mean, you do need to implement order quote just to allow people to get that tax information, which you won't be able to get any other way from the uh, existing availability. Um, even if it's a confirmation that, you know, there isn't no tax applicable. Um, but it's, it's checking that that is, is an available space. But as you uh, say, okay. So you, that, that really is actually a separate API than one we need to implement. 
Um, would, yes, it is a separate endpoint you would need to implement from. Yeah. Um, but it's it's a very very lightweight one, which you would probably be using whatever you're, however you're creating your feed. Very similar logic would probably exist in here, so it shouldn't sure. be complicated. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, no worries. So, so that's that, uh, and then order, um, which which creates the order. Has anyone got any questions on on this before we move on to the next bit, which is the detailed flow? Uh, just that again in slightly more detail. Uh, about this order code, is it? Uh, do we have to cover both uh, cases where there could be a member who's already in your system or somebody anonymous trying to just find out the price, base price? Or the price, uh, the, the price has to be very specific to somebody which the booking system needs to be aware of. Ah, good point. So in the scope of this specification, uh, I should have said that earlier. Um, so the uh, this specification is about guest checkout only. Um, and so it doesn't have any, there's no changes based on who the user is, the member. Um, it's just about, uh, I, as, as you would with, uh, in Legend, you know ticket booking? Yeah, online ticketings, yeah. Exactly. So, so same idea. So it's, it's you know, you just don't have any connection to the real person. Oh, okay, so it's all anonymous then. Exactly. Okay. Um, well, anonymous, uh, uh, yes, anonymous except for, and so maybe I'll talk about this. Um, in some, some cases, um, so let's just talk about, about leasing for a second, and then I'll, I'll, and that will explain why it's not totally anonymous but relatively anonymous compared to member membership and other things. Um, so for leasing, the best way of explaining leasing is if, if you go and buy uh, uh, something from Amazon, if you want to buy a book from Amazon and there's only one book left, then you will only get that book for yourself when you give them your credit card details and press pay. Until that point, if there's only one left, then it's not reserved for you anyone else who's also looking at that same page browsing can get that book and, and, and buy it. And that means when you get to the end of your checkout process, the book you're looking to buy has already gone. So someone's stolen it from your basket basically while you're, while you're looking to buy it. Um, and that's because there's no lease, there's no reservation on the book um, before the point where you purchase. So that's in the world of, um, of Amazon. Uh, let's take a different example. Let's take Ticketmaster for theater booking. And with theater booking, it's the other way around. So if I wanted to book Hamilton, um, I would start a clock ticking as soon as I look at the page. I don't put any detail in, I just look at the page. And as soon as I do that, and I, and I look at the page for my two seats, it's reserved them. Um, and so no one can take those seats um, while I'm looking and while I'm putting my details in. And so that's in theater, it works like that. Um, one of the things that's come out from the workshops um, as part of the spec is that in this sector, there's a bit of a, a, a most people think ideally we should have the theater experience, right? If you have a, a squash court and you're in the process of booking it, you don't want to get to the end of that process and find that someone else has nicked it because you were too slow typing your credit card detail in. Um, so people look, it sounds like most people want that experience, but the reality of the systems is that it's not always possible to create a fully anonymous lease. So that is a lease that hasn't got any details associated with it at all. Um, maybe because of the volume of requests that would create uh, in terms of all the you know, number of transactions or whatever it is. Um, so there's a halfway this spec offers, which is this customer details. So uh, the idea is that in the process here, you make the check out, you make the first quote call when you've just browsing, when you've got no further detail, you make the second checkpoint call after they've registered and you make the booking call after they put their payment details in. And what that means is that as a booking system, if you want to, it's optional, you can lease uh, the space that's, the, you know, the items that they're looking to book. Um, and you can lease those items at the point of checkpoint one and at the point of checkpoint two, if you want to, optionally. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's fine. So where are the customer details held? I assume it's in the on the broker side. Yeah, the customer details are held on the broker side and they're passed uh, in the order quote. They're passed inside the order quote object as well uh, for, for checkpoint two. Okay. 
Yeah. Um, so, so um, the one more question was about: uh, Is this workflow? Uh, is it going to support multiple bookings in one one order, or is it yes. one one booking per order? M multiple bookings, yeah. So and user can add and remove as he want during before he has uh, committed it. Exactly. So the order quote uh, is is exactly that. It's just a a new quote of a number of items. So you might the first order quote might be two items, then you might add one and make another quote for three, and then two, and then one. Um, and if you wanted to do a lease optionally, you will update that lease every time you get a quote updated. Uh, you would remove and add things according to the latest quote you've received. Okay, that's good. Um, and then the idea is that if when you get to book. Um, obviously you've already, if you've got a lease with that quote, then the order will use that, that call will use the lease. Uh, if the lease is expired or for any reason, the lease is, is, is not, not there, then it will try and get a new lease. So in B, um, the only reason that B will fail is nothing to do with leasing. B will only fail if there's no spaces available. So if it's not possible to make the booking for that particular arrangement which makes it slightly more robust because otherwise, obviously, if there's issues with leases, you've got a load of error states, leases expired, get a new lease, all this stuff. Um, and the way that's possible, and so I guess I can move on to this, um, is that you have a, a unique identifier, uh, globally unique identifier that you create as a broker and you submit with the order quote. And that same globally unique identifier is reused throughout the process. So you use it with the broker, use it again for, sorry, use it for the first quote, use it for the second quote, and you use it for the booking. And if you wanted to create a lease, again, optional, you can create the lease against that unique identifier. Um, and then that can be used uh, for the actual booking itself. So I, I realized I moved on there. Does anyone have any other questions on the, the, the previous diagram before we just cover the rest of this or? No, all good? Um, I, I just assume uh, around the payments um, uh, about the, the kind of flexibility of, of uh, payment provider. Um, is that something we're, we're covering on the school or? Uh, the uh, yeah, so absolutely. So um, there's a good point there, which is that the um, payments themselves, uh, let's go back to the scope. So obviously the payment provider is outside yeah. of the, uh, the scope here. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's something that is, is not, it, it's, it, you can use any payment provider as, as you want to do that. Um, and then there's a, uh, where is it in the scope section here? Um, so the key point here is that payment processing and business models are outside of the scope of the specification. So rather than us trying to account for all the different types of, uh, you know, move credits or um, employee wellness vouchers or whatever, the various yeah. types of um, monthly invoicing, um, credit cards, we don't, don't worry about any of that. Yeah. Um, and that, that flexibility means that uh, actually the booking system is just dealing with the registration of the bookings and not the payment aspect at all. Um, cool. Okay, that's great. No, I mean, it's, it's um, really important for us that uh, we've not been able to do integrations in the past because um, an operator might be, for one reason or another, uh, inflexible around their payment provider. Uh, right. And it's a real deal killer for us that. Okay, great to know, fantastic. So, um, okay, yeah. So there's that. That's part. That's part of the reason this is in there, just to make sure that that, that is that that flexibility yeah. does exist. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, an example of that is um, WorldPay won't really interact with people that don't own their own, own assets. Really. Um, yeah. So uh, if you're dealing with a client who takes payment by WorldPay, um, then as a marketplace, it's incredibly, it's almost impossible to do anything because they just won't give any sort of accreditation to marketplaces that don't have their own assets that act as agents only. Um, Interesting. So um, it's, a, it's a real big problem. Right? Wow, okay, sure. That's, 
It's especially interesting because I know a lot of the um, customers use WorldPay, uh, the, the um, current booking system, sorry, the current um, big providers use WorldPay. I think, I think yeah. everyone active does. Yeah, I know, I know, yeah. Um, so it's something that um, in this book and spec, if it can open it for us, um, you know, keep that open for, for us marketplaces, that would be really, really uh, brilliant. But, <laughs> but back to the payment thingy. Um, if you go back to the diagram with the four actors or agents, so mm -hmm. this and uh, whatnot. Yeah. Uh, the one. Yeah. So it, it it might be the case that you have more than one payment provider. Um, and let, let me let me explain that a bit more. So let's say, for example, here we are at my local pitch. We're using Stripe. Mm -hmm. So when the customer pays any money through the broker, the broker being us. Uh, it goes through a stripe. Um, so nothing stops us from, okay, so we take all the money from on a stripe and then later we do the payment reconciliation to cash. So we could do a bank transfer at the end of it. So we are not enforcing, so the, the, the data provider is not enforcing the broker to use, for example, World Pay, and we don't have to enforce our customers to use World Pay either. So each one can, we can decouple these things. So we are using a Stripe and we're happy with that. And then we pay money every month to them through cash by a, I don't know, bank or whatever. So Absolutely right. That's exactly it. So it doesn't matter. The seller receives the money um, from the broker through some means uh, and the booking spec, the booking system doesn't, um, in this spec, doesn't have any connection to that. So. Any any way of doing that, you know, sending gold bars in the post uh, or so, whatever it is. No, um, I just wanted to stress out the fact that maybe uh, um, it's not that you have to have only one payment provider. You could have one more than one way to actually move money from one place to another. Oh, that's so, true. Yeah, you're right. It's plurality. You're totally right. There's no reason why there's one of these in this. Company. Exactly. That's, yeah. that, that was my point. Um, right. Okay. I'll, I'll make that clear in the spec. You're totally right. Um, the the, the um, the broker here is actually um, uh, yeah, able to use multiple payment providers uh, as agreed with the seller. Um, the only thing that, that, that this currently um, requires is that there's some identifier that relates to the booking. Uh, so it relates to the payment is posted to the booking system and that's just for audit. So if there's an ID that you get from a particular transaction, you just take that ID and you give it to the booking system so that the seller can trace between the two. Yeah, um, no, absolutely. But, but yeah, uh, it's just the fact that there are actually two, uh, two amounts of money flowing from two different actors. So there is one money, money flowing from the customer into the broker and then money flowing, flowing from the broker into the seller. And these two things could be done um, in different ways. Absolutely. In fact, it might be best. I can just, this diagram probably would be quite helpful for this. So for the case of an agent broker, which is most, I think most people will be um, in the UK, especially because of the tax situation um, there is the money that flows from the customer to the seller uh, there's money that is then exchanged between seller and broker or customer and broker um, for commission or whatever it is um, but the commission payments and things like that are outside of scope here so the only thing that is in scope is this is relationship between the customer and the seller and again it's not how the money gets transferred um, so it doesn't matter how the money is transferred it just it just matters that that amount that is specified is transferred um, yeah. between those two and so therefore the tax calculated is the appropriate amount of tax um, from the seller's perspective okay cool cool um, and that's actually why there's there's a ability to override as well so you can override um, sorry just to, for completeness and I'll skip back to the what we were saying before but this is really helpful um, so in offer overrides you can actually override um, uh, the price as a um, as a broker if you wanted to and that override allows you to specify different price assuming the seller was already happy with it and the idea is the booking system would then calculate everything in as usual with the new price just accepting that new price and, and calculating the tax accordingly as if the price in the booking system itself had changed um, so that means that what that means is that with the previous diagram that everything is then possible. So um, if you wanted to change any of the numbers surrounding this, you can do that, including this one in the main amount that's being transferred. 
So for in theory, you could make it free, right? You could have zero payment here, and then you could you could pay it entirely um, this way or however. I mean, as long as the tax are all checked out, um, which there's more detail on in here, um, then you can you can do a part part payment. You can do all sorts of stuff. Great. That sounds good. Cool. Okay. Fantastic. Really, really helpful. Um, okay. So um, I think what we were just about to go on to here was um, the order quote. Uh, so we, we've, we basically, this is exactly the same thing we've covered already. So order quote call is made, the order quote comes back, and then a further call is made, order quote comes back. And then finally, there's a, um, sorry, this is the wrong diagram. And then finally, there's a, um, uh, the final order call is made, and then you, you authorize and capture the payment either side of that. And when you've made that order call and captured the payment, it's then up to the broker to do the invoice generation. Um, and this is something else that's worth highlighting here. So um, the way that this is set up, this diagram, it's a bit like a Venn diagram. Um, the orders are held in the booking system. Uh, the invoices are held in the broker and the payments and refunds are held in the broker or in the book in the payment provider. Um, obviously the payment provider will be the system of record for the payments and refunds, but the broker has visibility of that. So this, this blue line visibility, the broker can see everything, but the booking system actually doesn't have visibility of the payments and refunds. This is a, uh, an Ian thing, uh, Shab, if you're interested why that is the case, <laughs> it's uh, his legacy of leaving those things separate. Um, because he didn't want the complexity of um, the payments and the invoices to be in, in the booking system. Uh, it's, too, it's much more effort to deal with calculating that. And also, an invoice is a legal document, so you need to store every version of it. Um, and uh, as we've mentioned, there are different currencies. So you could, the invoice could be move credits, not pounds. So you would need to then deal with that. So the idea is that we put the invoice where the diversity exists in the kind of payment methods and the, and the currencies and things uh, in the middle uh, and the broker responsible for that. And the, the orders is what the booking system is responsible for because that's, the, that's where the inventory lives. And so the booking system deals with orders. Um, and as we've said, the payments are outside of scope uh, for the booking system as well and, um, and for the spec in general, but that's something that the uh, broker would deal with however they want to deal with it. So, <clears throat> that that doesn't mean that the, the the broker can't issue a refund. Uh, the broker can issue a refund. Yeah, absolutely. They can issue a refund, and if they do that, they need to cancel the order accordingly. Uh, okay. So you okay? Cool. Is there any we we will see anything about that today? Uh, yeah, yeah. We can do cancellation. Uh, that's, okay, cool. So let's do let's do cancellation next after. Um, just wanted to show you back to this uh, this diagram. So you've got the whole flow. So you can see that's what invoice generation means. And the other thing is customer notification. So customer notification is that, again, the broker is responsible for notifying the customer, primarily because it's an app or it's an Apple Watch or it's an Alexa or, you know, it's a voice command. Whatever the medium is through which the person is booked, if that is, you know, uh, they've they've asked their car to do it for them. Um, then that is where the notification should come back to say the booking has been successful or there's a cancellation, which we'll talk about in a minute, something like that. Um, and that's why, so there's no, there's no notifications that come from the booking system. Um, all the booking system needs to do is, is, we talked about an order feed earlier, the order feed is where those things happen. So there's a feed of orders the booking system provides to the broker. And if they want to cancel something, the booking system just posts the thing to that feed. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but the, the basic idea is that notification and the invoice generation on the broker side, because that's where the diversity exists, that's where the, where the relationship exists, and that's the channel that's being used. Um, and to make that real, what that means is we don't expect the booking system to send emails to the email address, although the email address might be provided. Um, it wouldn't be, the booking system wouldn't be spent sending any emails, that would be the broker. And in the phone number is optional. Uh, to be provided, but if the phone number was provided, we wouldn't expect necessarily the seller to call the phone number uh, to tell them about a cancellation. We would expect again that to be they've clicked the cancel button in the booking system, and that's that's the cancellation is done. 
Um, so we're not we're not uh, we're trying to ensure that the uh, relationship um, where the is consistent and people don't get confused by different people calling them or emailing them. Um, yeah. um, can I can I ask uh, just on that final point? So in the scenario that a pitch is um, waterlogged and uh, the operator needs to cool off the game, um, they click the cancel button. And what that notifies the broker, who then should notify the um, the the booker. Absolutely. So let's let's yes, that's exactly right. Let's just jump into cancellation. Then I think that's probably the thing to do. So uh, we've got the flow. Um, so the way cancellation works is, let me find it. Uh, there we go. Cancellation um, is is here so uh cancellation for a well let's start with provider cancellation because it's easier and the flows are, mi are mirrored um so provider cancellation oh maybe it's before that uh hang on mending customer cancelling customer requested cancellation after that should be all the issues provided there you go, seller requested cancellation. So the seller requested cancellation is really easy. There's an order feed, and what they do is they post an item for the order feed, which is that the seller's canceled. Um, with a note, they can include a cancellation message if they want to. The pitch is waterlogged. Uh, really sorry. Um, and they submit that. And then that then what happens is that the broker collects that information from the, the feed and then they issue the refund. If that's the you know so that they and in this spec there's no partial refunds that's one of the issues in here so it's an all or nothing situation uh, if you receive a cancellation you issue a refund um, or if you don't if you want to try and rebook them of course you can because you're dealing with payments you can call up your customer and say hey your pitch is waterlogged would you like to rebook or something um, but as far as the booking system is concerned as far as reconciliation is concerned at the point where that is posted to the feed the the cancellation has happened so that's done so there shouldn't be any situation where a customer is saying hang on i never got my refund um because it's the responsibility of the broker entirely at that point to clearly um indicate to the customer what's going on so the pitch was waterlogged and it got cancelled the money from the booking system's perspective has been refunded if there was a delay to that refund because you know any you wanted to call them up and keep their business in a different way um, and reuse that money. You would need to be very clear to the customer that the money has been refunded onto their account or something, and they can have it back anytime they want. We're just calling it as a courtesy, that kind of thing. Um, because from a legal perspective, um, we talked about the agent broker relationship before. Um, from a legal perspective, at that point, the seller has refunded the money to the um, the, the, to the the customer. So the, the broker will has to be, uh, will have to be uh, pulling data from the. Add PDE all the all the time to make sure that there are no cancellations. Yes, exactly. That's right. Okay, cool. Uh, and the RPDE order feed is a feed specific to each broker, so it will only contain your orders. I think um, um, you mentioned that the phone number is um, uh, an optional field uh, and not necessary to pass on to the uh, to the operator. Um, is there a reason for that? Why it's optional, not mandatory? Just in terms of data capture, keeping it to a minimum so that we don't collect any of the, basically so that the simplest possible case of booking is possible. Um, so if you want to, if you want to provide more details for customer experience, of course, the, you can, you can add them in, but uh, equally, if you don't have a phone number, you're not, uh, you're still allowed to book. Yeah. It just might be that it's a slightly less, less good experience for the customer. Yeah. Um, I know. Probably shouldn't do this. Speak on behalf of the other side of the table, but you should um, do that absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, you will find there is a bit of resistance about that um, in our conversations, and I do think there's um, a lot of justification uh, where the operator would want that phone number uh, of the customer, uh, and um, you know, as a as a broker, I don't personally have a problem with that because. Uh, ultimately, if, you know, it means that the customer is def definitely told 
that there is a cancellation, then um, uh, that is a better user experience. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I just think people will really want to get that phone number and would argue, you know, I might argue quite strongly that it's their right to get the phone number. Uh, and we've had, you know, uh, negotiations with um, operators that do say that and um, are quite forceful on that point. Interesting. That's really interesting. And what's the, I mean, is that because they don't trust the cancellation process? I mean, if there was a better, if there was a better cancellation process in place and they could trust that they pressed the button and it worked, um, I mean, are they yeah. getting it? Yeah. It's just, I, I guess it's just on the ground, operational staff, someone on a Saturday doesn't really know the systems or um, isn't you know, educated as to how it all works. Um, you know, if they start panicking, um, then at least if they've got a phone number, it's within their control. Um, if they don't have a phone number and let's say they're trying to call my local bitch, trying to get in touch with the customer, it just creates quite a stressful situation um, in, in practice. Um, and so I think, um, yeah, mm -hmm. giving the venues a kind of ability, and, and, and they would argue, as some have in the past, that um, it is a kind of requirement of the booking to get the phone number so that they can do that in case there is a problem. Brilliant. So my, I guess my question would be, do you think it should be a requirement of the, inter the relationship that the broker has with the, with the venue from a, a kind of contractual perspective and it's a conversation you negotiate with each one? Um, uh, or do you think it should be mandated in the spec as a technical requirement and controlled at that, at that level? Um, I think to ensure... <laughs> I, I, I can see the point. I, I, I think to ensure kind of real operator buy-in, I would suggest that just making it mandatory and taking any um, debate out of the equation would be sensible as long as it comes with the appropriate GDPR kind of marketing confirmation. Um, then uh, I think it would be simpler just to say it's needed and that's the time. Simply say it's what, sorry? Uh, it's required. Yeah. Okay. That's good to hear. Um, as a so, I guess what I'm thinking is is obviously this for pitch booking makes a lot of sense in the context of other types of activities which would be booked. Um, so Zumba classes, etc. Is that always the case? And does every type of front end want to do the same? Um, yeah. I, 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 I think that's another. Yeah, it's out of my um, kind of particular area of expertise. Totally, yeah, yeah. So I'm just thinking because um, we we tried to to do the, the required fields. We've been quite careful about in the past, and just in terms of what you know what limitations that places on on people. But I can totally see the point, and we should we should raise that um, uh, in the in the wider discussion about whether people feel like that should be required at the different levels. Because as you say, if if if, techni if technically we're happy to keep it optional, but certain re operators require it, then it will be really easy for a broker to make it required. Of course you could just check that no bookings are being made from my local pitch that don't have a phone number in. That'd be really easy to do. Um, yeah, that is true, for sure. The yeah. converse is obviously a lot more difficult. If it, the system requires it and you can't physically make the call to the booking system if you don't have the detail, there's no way out of that. Like you can't, unless you start putting X's in there or, you know, yeah. other data, um, which... I, no, I, I, I think that's true. And uh, perhaps to your point, for a Zimba class, um, uh, if it's not required, then maybe don't make it required, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I just want you here, participant. I, I think making it mandatory is, is uh, not not not, a, not the way most of our customers want to go. Um, our customers are yeah, activity providers and their customers are the people that book on, obviously. So um, most of ours, yeah, we, we have the option as a tick box and they can make it mandatory or optional uh, or not required at all, have a phone number. but. Um, some some of them are pushing back saying, you know, if, if they ask mandatory to have a phone number, people are, are dropping off and not actually making the booking. So, oh, right. People, you know, a lot of people now just don't, don't want to give it. They don't want to be called up. They just want to make the booking online. They want to provide an email address, and a pocket, get an email confirmation, make payment, carry on. They don't really want us, anyone to call them up. Um, but that's what I'm saying. We provide it. You know, it's up to you. you as a, if you're putting on an event, um, you, you, have, you have obviously have the choice. You can make it. You have to be honest. You have to find a phone number you can't book, or it's optional. But um, make it, I think forcing it to happen is 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 not the way we would like to go. But. Okay. Yeah. 
that's helpful. That's that's really good. That's I guess that that's like the other side of it, isn't it? No, it sounds like it's a different activity really that we're doing, which is why yeah. if you're booking a pitch, it's very different to um, yeah. yeah some of those other activities. So. Um, okay. Yeah, if, if I was like booking, booking pitches like like I do for my, my local football team, then you want yeah find your phone number because you want to know straight away if it's rained off or something. Or I'm happy to for someone to call me, but yeah. Right. Absolutely. Uh, that makes sense. Um, okay, yeah. So um, that sounds like it's uh, you know we we could we could keep that uh, as a as a, a we could make it recommended or optional. But I suppose from a practical perspective, it doesn't. We're not going to fail any if we keep it as recommended or optional. No one's going to fail validation against the spec by uh, uh, not in, not including it. But of course, as you say, um, it might well be that from the pitcher's perspective, um, uh, GLL will only work with. Uh, companies that book pictures that provide phone numbers, right? And that's just something that happens at that at that level. Cool. Okay. Uh, does anyone else have any thoughts on on that, or uh, should we just go to cancel customer cancellation? What I love about this is, regardless of the number of people on the call, we can always have a good debate, <laughs> and it's usually like pretty much what you know. If you had fifty people on the call, you would end up with the same result. It's great. Um, so so good um so uh let's just jump into ca customer cancellation so this is uh sim exactly the same process that happens at the, the latter stages so you get that that cancellation request customer cancelled refunds processed invoice generated um from the rpde so the rpde process is the same the bit that happens before that is obviously the, the trigger is different so the trigger doesn't happen from the the um seller this time it happens from the customer um the, the reason it's exactly the same here is because it makes it quite easy to implement for both sides so you just you know the feed is the same uh watching the feed for refunds is the same and processing that and generating invoices and notifications to say the refunds confirmed is all the same regardless of how it happened in the first place um the uh difference is that when you uh, request a cancellation uh, here that you actually go through this this quick process, which is that you say um, first thing is that you you check the order to check that it's cancelable. So allow simple cancellation is true. If it is, uh, if it can be cancelled, um, then you attempt cancellation with this um, patch order quote thing, which is basically saying you just you patch the the same um, JSON body with customer cancelled status against the items because there's multiple items against the items that you want to cancel um, and then uh, that's if that works then you patch again but with the order so it's similar kind of two-phase commit that we had during order creation but this time for cancellation and that what that allows you to do is um, in between the two patch calls you can say to the customer are you happy to receive a five pound refund because what the first call has returned to you is the is the new order as it would be, with the refund was processed. So if you if you pr tr you know press the button to cancel, you can make the first call, and get back from the booking system what the new order looks like. Do a bit of a difference of what that looks like compared to what payments you've taken as a broker. So I've taken ten pounds payment. I've cancelled one item. Five pounds has come off that total. So I announce it to the customer. You know, do you do you want to continue or receive a five pound refund? They press yes. Crack on previous version of the specification didn't have the extra confirmation step you would just as a customer blindly request a cancellation and then whatever was due to you would come to you an email um, this is added as a um, following feedback that actually having that two step in there so the customer knows what they're doing expectations are managed um, it means that that's probably likely to result in a better customer experience and probably less phone calls being confused or annoyed as to why something's happened different to what they're expecting um, so does that all make sense? Sorry, I didn't follow that. So when you do the batch order quote, it's basically like a request for the cancellation. Yeah. And then it's not only an, uh, then when you batch the order, when you actually are requesting, when you're actually performing the cancellation. Yes. Okay, cool. And the other thing is that, um, even though in in this diagram it seems like the broker is pulling the data from the RPD all the time, uh, it, the, the I mean the the obvious solution would be that the, we we the broker will have to store all these other quotes in our database to speed these things up. No, 
That's exactly right. So you're so so I, I should have mentioned that part of the, the contract uh, with both sides here is that when the um, where's the big diagram gone? Well, yeah, at the end of this process, um, you store the uh, order that comes out of B, you come that comes out of this this put call. You store that immediately, and then any updates. Um, yeah. So any any updates then that come in as the RPDE feed are effectively patch calls to you. So they're kind of inbound patch calls. So you might store the whole order along with custom metadata that you might have because you obviously might want to store more than what you've sent to the booking system as a broker. Um, and then any time the booking system wants to update that, they send a patch in and that updates that accordingly. Okay, cool. Cool. Um, okay. Nick, I'm sorry, I'm just going to have to bring back on one point um, that uh, you mentioned earlier, which is about partial refunds. Yeah. Uh, and you said that that isn't being included in this uh, spec. Right, um, currently it's not. Is, is, that a, um, is that a kind of um, final decision? or? Uh, there's a, I think there's a GitHub issue still open for it, so okay. that's, that's not. Uh, it's this one, arbitrary refunds are not in scope. Um, so refunds are only permitted on entire items. Um, so there's no way of saying, so it's an item by item thing. So if you dynamically price an item, the item's booked, at that point it exists in the order at that price. And all you can do is cancel the item completely or not. Um, so although in theory, the broker could do something different uh, because the broker is in charge of generating invoices, of course. Um, but from the booking system's perspective and any reconciliation with the um, provider, with the seller, uh, that, as far as the booking system's concerned, as soon as it's cancelled, that's completely cancelled at the moment. Um, what okay. What's the uh, use case? <laughs> <laughs> we, we, uh, often um, we do uh, get asked to issue partial refunds. Um, so an example might be Floodlight shut out halfway through a booking, uh, and right. um, it's not really our decision how much of that booking to refund. Um, it's the operator's decision. So if they say uh, issue half the refund, then um, we 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 would often do that. Um, you're saying in this case it would have to come from the the operator. Uh, is that right? Um, wow, how would you do that here? Well, the challenge is a reconciliation problem. So at the moment, the way this is suggested it, it works is that if you trigger a cancellation, that, that that booking is entirely canceled. That really is focused on before the event occurs and, and a whole cancellation before the event. Um, if you want to do a refund after the event has occurred, that order has been stored now, that's in the past, that's done. Um, that's interesting about how you then reconcile that with the, um, with the seller. I mean, because you're doing the reconciliation, there's no reason why you couldn't have a line item at the bottom of your monthly invoice that said number of partial refunds and just put it on there. Um, and that would be what we call it, like an out of band solution. So not in, the spec wouldn't have it in there, that you would just have like an adjustment for partial refunds. Um, and so if they were doing that true up against, you know, everyone actives, um, department of fi finance, we're going through and looking at all the orders they're expecting their booking system would match, you know, or GLL, their booking system would match all those bookings that were being made. And then the line items up on your invoice at the bottom would just say, you know, subtract these, these numbers for partial refunds. Uh, and then th therefore they would still be able to reconcile everything is one way around that. Okay, I'll, I'll have a look at the uh, GitHub issue um, and consider that. Uh, I, I can see that would work. Uh, and so in those cases, you'd still be able to issue that partial refund. Um, yeah, the, 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 challenge, the challenge I guess we've got is because multiple items could be in the order. Uh, the question of how, if we wanted to go down the road of in, implementing partial refunds, you could do a patch call, for example, to the booking to say, change the prices of each item but it gets a bit sketchy as to how you're because it's item by item based or is it a partial refund on the whole that's i guess because it's, as soon as we start splitting into component parts and trying to refund parts of things um then it, it gets a little bit more um 
difficult to then even record that. So the order side on the booking system would then need to record uh, different types of partial states that the order could exist in. Um, yeah, I, I can see that. Um, let me have a look at the GitHub issue uh, and I'll see. But um, it, it's, a, it's a pretty small edge case. Um, um, if it's possible through a workaround, then that maybe is good. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. I don't know if you, um, anyone on the booking system side have any thoughts on that? Uh, Roger or Shahab? Yeah, well, uh, it's Roger here. Um, it's the, the only thing that, I, that kind of crosses my mind on that one is if someone books like a block of 10 sessions or something. Um, and then, you know, attends attend six of them and then doesn't want to attend the last four for some reason. Mm -hmm. and they're entitled to a refund of, you know, four out of 10 sessions. Mm. Uh, but it's, it's, I mean, again, it's a case like it's, it's you know, it, it, could, it, it happens a fair amount. It's the way we've got at the moment, we just refund them. You know, the, the, the person putting on the event could go in there and say, okay, I'll give you a 25 refund and it just goes through the system back onto that card. Um, but... Yeah, uh, and where, where are you storing that refund? Is it against the order total if they've got several yeah. things in the basket, or is it the individual items? No, it's against that. It's against that. Uh, just so you, you know, you're buying ten yoga classes for the next ten weeks, and you break your leg or something, you don't. You can't take the last four. It's up to the, it's, uh, the discretion of the, the yoga person. Yeah, the person put it on the, the class, but they say, yeah, you can have a refund of you know it's five thousand session. I'm going to give you twenty pounds back, and it's stored against the order of that of that ten ten classes that ten class order. Right, that makes sense. So I mean, we yeah, did that, that I can see we could do the same at an order level here quite easily. We could have a partial refund amount that is then uh, updated, basically by arbitrarily by the um, broker, so that uh, the booking system has that 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 record they can uh, provide. But of course, it's di yeah, it, but it might be difficult to know when to post those into the accounting if. If, you're, if your order includes items that span multiple months because it's a course and then you put a cancellation in when that's actually accounted for um, could, be, uh, could be tricky. But I suppose that happens in full refunds anyway. Um, it just yeah, I mean, we, we just, we just uh, when, when we you know, receive the, the, the money from, the, from the, the customer, we just pay that out to the organizer. Um, and you know, if it's fans for it's up to where they put that money, I don't know. Yeah, it's up to them in their accounts. But we just pay it out and we receive it. Fine. Got it. Makes sense. Okay. Um what do you think, Shahab, on that point? Uh, well in, in our system we either do a full refund or no refund. Uh, but in case let's say there was a problem with the class, something broke down, so a member is due for a courtesy refund kind of thing. So what we do is that we issue a credit note credit note which could be of the full amount of the class or it could be let's say 10 percent or 20 percent something like this this is how we do things in legend uh, so what how it has to be implemented uh, in, in this side is uh, really up to what customers would want it to be implemented mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that makes sense yes because of course we don't have any notion of a credit note here so we wouldn't be able to um yes issue a credit note as such through the broker uh, so i guess it sounds like it's slightly different yep okay okay well that's really helpful we'll go, yeah I'll look, I'll, i guess i'll look out for your um you know follow up on that jamie in terms of um thoughts and uh i mean um, if if we think this is a really important thing to, um and 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 some some booking systems want to implement it and some brokers want it too then we can obviously add, add that in um, it's just just kind of balancing, keeping it simple versus putting too much in there. But it seems like the more the, there's a few things like this, which obviously are kind of sat, like need, need to be there hygiene factors. If we don't have them, then we're going to uh, create an, a, a bit of anno annoyance for everybody, and we're going to be running around having manual phone calls and sending each other five pounds in the post. Um, so okay, great. Well, uh, there is. There's one thing I just want to check. Uh, when we offer a price to a broker, is the price uh, dependent upon number of items or some other kind of similar discount? To, so the later when you ref, uh, refund, let's say one of the items, that would actually invalidate the price of the other item as well. 
So, mm -hmm. how, how, when the price is calculated, how is the price uh, calculated? Is it based on any kind of promotion or no, the number of items? That's a really good point. Well, at the moment, uh, the way it works is that the order, the, the price calculation, um, let's see if I can get an example here. Um, it's up to you how you do that. So, um, when the uh, order quote comes back, let's get some JSON. Uh, the order quote comes back. Um, that's, so that's sorry. Let's just go back up. This is the post you're making that includes the order items. Just says I want this item and this offer. Uh, so quite simple. There's the customer details, phone number, and email address. Only email is currently mandatory. The others are all optional. Um, and then the order creation comes back and you can see here the, the bunch of other information comes back but then so does um, the expanded order item and, the, uh, and the, the order item and the offer. So the offer is 10 pounds. And so you'll have an array of these, um, that's an array of ordered items um, with their associated tax and the total amount uh, is actually then included at the bottom here. So you've got total payment due, five pounds, total tax uh, of that amount is uh, is one one pound. And so um, in this case, uh, yeah, it, it, the total is still calculated by the booking system if you had some updates to that, because when you make the patch call to the cancellation, it updates the, the whole order and gives you a new total. Um, there's nothing to stop you making calculations based on number of items or whatever you want, uh, as long as the total comes out. Uh, the broker so uh, if we later then cancel one of the items, then we'll have to either cancel, uh, refund the price of that one item or probably cancel the other item as well because that was part of the deal. Yeah, or yeah, cancel the other item or, or cancel one and recalculate the price of the first you could do and then as long as this total payment due here is updated and the individual items are updated um, in the patch call um, then that the broker can pass that on as a new invoice okay I'm not sure because this is something we uh, implement in our system but I'm not sure whether it's valid for the use case over here yeah so it may not support it at all yeah, that sounds likely. Yeah, that sounds likely. Like at the beginning, rather than, yeah, maybe it's simpler to leave it uh, as a simple, more simple case. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we've we've kind of we've come to our um, our time box here on the call, um, and it's been incredibly useful. We've we've got some issues and hopefully shared some knowledge as well about the different areas of the specification. Um, it's quite good going through it again, actually, because even though we've gone through it a few times now. We find different bits each time, and uh, so we're continually refining all of this. Um, so you've, you've, you guys on the call who are completely new to this, so you've got a, an idea of how much of the spec we've covered. Um, we, we've really covered the mo all the diagrams that are key to this, um, including the, um, the, the different uh, approaches to cancellation. We've included the uh, tax we touched on. Um, we included uh, the roles and responsibilities diagram. We included uh, agent broker and that setup. There's more detail in the spec that covers other areas um, around different other types of brokers that could exist, uh, direct uh, and, and reseller models. Um, there's also um, a few other nuances around if the opportunities are completely free, what do we do with that? I um, uh, thing we didn't get to touch on, but we did, we did talk, on, uh, talk about briefly is that uh, you, there's an approval flow available as well, so you can um, you can choose to uh, wait for an approval to come back before you confirm that booking, uh, and that's this uh, additional where is it flow here, uh, which has just got a slightly different end to it. Wait for the approval to come back, confirms the booking. Um, so I think I think you've covered like I would say most of the spec in terms of the model uh, uh, kind of outline. Um, so yeah, I'd encourage you obviously to, to, to read through and if you have any comments, we're going to be next in two weeks time, we're going to come back and, um, and pick this up again um, and, and go and, and do the similar thing to what we're doing here, go through the spec again. Um, uh, so you've got a refresher of it, but then come into the detail. Um, so you can ask further questions if you've had a chance to read the spec between now and then. Um, you know, we can answer any issues, of course, in between and you know my email, um, feel free to ask any questions.
Um, and uh, and then the idea is that next time we'll we'll have uh, by the end of it we'll have a, a full knowledge of, of all the different areas. Um, and we should be at the end that you know, you, we see there's a few small refinements coming out each time we do it, which is really great. So hopefully next time we'll be um, nearing the end of that uh, and we'll, we'll have um, all, more of the small things done. Uh, so uh, has anyone else got any other? Oh, one more really important bit of other, other business. Sorry, before I ask if anyone's got any other business, because um, we are short on time, is there's, there's a booking workshop on the 2nd of April. Uh, if you haven't been invited by me already, uh, I'll send the invite out to the list so you you can all see what that is. Um, that is a, a, an open invite to a, a workshop in real life where we're going to talk through the spec uh, and the aspects of the decisions we've made with a big group of people. Um, a lot of uh, senior stakeholders in the sector are coming along to that workshop, so it should be a really good opportunity to um, get into the detail of, of questions and comments um, and, uh, and uh, have a, a final opportunity to be back on the spec. So the next call is, as we discussed, then we've got that workshop. Final call then will be talking about anything that's come out of the workshop, if there's any changes we need to make off the back of that, the suggestions with a view to then finally submitting the spec for um, uh, release on the 12th of April. That's our current timeline, assuming uh, there's no disruptive forces at play or we haven't completely missed anything. Um, so yeah, let's just try and nail down the, uh, the couple of issues that raised today if we can before uh, we next get together. And that means that we, we should be looking like it you know, in a really good place for the second. Um, does anyone else have any other business before we conclude? Uh, yes, uh, not sure how entirely relevant it is to everyone on this bit of the call, but I will flag it anyway, which is that um, there is a world outside of booking and I've been doing a little bit of work looking at, at the disability, the accessibility, sorry, standards. Um, so it's part of the, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Nick, as part of the data model for Open Active, we have um, some kind of bits around accessibility. Um, and I've had some conversations with different uh, disability rights kind of organizations about what kind of data we might want to collect. So I've just done a little kind of summary doc on Google to cover where the standard is at the moment, some of the current suggestions and kind of call a, a bit of a call for any further suggestions. So for example, you might have seen today that um, the Parasport platform is launching and they're using some of the open active data, which is amazing. Wow. But, um, I know they've just gone and done it, which is great. Um, but These people that never turn up to calls and then do all their stuff. Done. They're just doing this kind of <laughs> great. Um, so, uh, but their feedback was that there's not much data which includes the accessibility information at the moment. So, um, yeah, uh, might be another way for us to think also about um, data. I know also they're collecting data as well, which uh, we're talking to them about potentially publishing. So might be some extra stuff there coming through which would be great um so but uh there's kind of a bit of a bit of a call out so if anyone's got any thoughts on improving the standards in terms of the accessibility information then um have a look on that i posted it on the slack channel um for open active in a couple of different places um so i'm sure nick can kind of attach it to the email round that kind of goes around at the end if that's all right nick as well yeah totally um and and Thanks. actually it'd be, it'd be great if uh if you're able to share um uh, not now obviously but at some point the um information about what you know about what they're using of the data uh, and any challenges um because uh, i think um i think actually i spoke to a couple of new providers uh, this week who were quite keen to publish disability data uh Amazing. Sorry, data specifically for activities for that demographic uh, and uh, and so yeah, like to this will be a great thing to tell them. Oh, if you do that, it'll go in there. Uh, so. Yeah, yeah, I will find out what they are, have uh, used as their kind of requirements. But yeah, we'll let them know. Great. All right. Thanks so much, everybody, for your time, um, and look forward to um, uh, catching up in a couple of weeks. Great. Thanks, Nick. Cheers, then. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Bye. 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 Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.